far. And I want to talk about the, uh, so as uh, Michael said, you, you know, I, I've always uh, been invited well, many times just to talk about compressed sensing. And this time I wasn't. And I'm just, <laughs> so, it, so I'm, I'm so happy about it because uh, I can, and what I've decided, you know, is, is actually to talk about the other things as well. So I just have a conflict of interest. I, I am a founder and uh, board member of Inkspace Imaging, which is a company that uh, commercialized the coils that also I'm going to talk about now. So take, that, that what, take what I say with a grain of salt in that sense. Um, this is what I've done this morning, so I'm super pumped up. Went into the lake, it was cold and nice, so I'm like super nice. So just, just for this, it was, it was really worth it. Um, so let me... Um, so, so I was thinking about what, what to do, you know, uh, when, you know, given this talk based on, you know, all the speakers and I was just sitting in my office and kind of thinking and I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what I'm going to talk about. In particular, uh, should I talk about compressed sensing or shouldn't I? I've decided actually, um, then, I, then I remembered, you know, a couple years ago I, I gave this, this, this talk. And that was, that was the ISMRM, uh, I gave a talk at the ISMRM maybe uh, uh, two or three years ago, and I talked about the pediatric MRI, and I had this list. I had this list of what would be the ideal pediatric uh, system. Okay, so then uh, let's talk about this list, but uh, before that we need to go to the beginning. And the beginning is that uh, really pediatric body MRI is just very difficult. You know, MRI is really excellent for diagnostic pediatric diseases, but the impact so far has been quite low. There's huge challenges, you know. Children cannot keep still. There's, uh, you know, they cannot understand the notion of bre uh, breath hold, long exams, and so on and so forth. You know, um, CT is, is an option, but there is a radiation risk. Um, and then what they do, they put them under anesthesia. <laughs> you know, quite scary, right? So uh, this, is, this is a big deal, and we, we, what we wanted to do is to try to, to deal with that. Now, if you look at actually a CT scan, this is going to be a CT scan. You know, it's really frustrating as an MR scientist, you know, doing an MR, how fast it is. It's just ridiculous. Take, take a look. Three, two, one, done. That's it. That was a CT scan. Now, as an MR scientist, I really we would like to have something like this. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, unfortunately, with CT, though, um, of course, there's a significant risk for cancer from repeated exam, especially in pediatric patients who are much more uh, susceptible uh, to uh, ionizing radiation. And the contrast, of course, is poorer, but this is really where we want to go. We want to do something like this. So how does it work with MRI with anesthesia? Well, um, deep sedation to general anesthesia is, you know, is often needed to mitigate anxiety and motion. Um, sedation, though, has uh, you know, uh, short and both uh, short and long-term risks. There's lots of side effects uh, and complications. There's an increased risk for learning disabilities. Um, and of course, there is operational losses in terms of how long these exams have to be once you have to uh, use anesthesia. You have to put all this stuff and it's complicated. It really, really makes it uh, uh, problematic. So we want to get rid of it. So to avoid anesthesia, you have to prepare a patient. It's really, really important. Um, you have to have a procedure. For example, you know, small kids, you can use natural sleep or bundle and feed distract or entertain, but the one to five-year-olds, that, that's the most challenging. You can't reason with them, you can't put them to bed, you know, it's just, they don't understand the notion of breath holds, it's very, very difficult. So how can you deal with it? Well, fast imaging, yeah, if you can image fast, then that could help. To correct for motion, uh, to have minimum protocols, like, you know, the fastest you can, and to reduce acoustic noise, which pretty much uh, makes them uh, anxious. Okay, so these are uh, maybe ways to, uh, to mitigate with us. But really the problem is that scanners are just not designed for children in mind. They're designed for adults and just adapted secondary adaptation uh, to kids. In terms of, you know, hard, uh, environment, the hardware, the sequences, the protocols, you know, it's always second in mind. And that's really uh, the issue. So then, 
I had this list, this list that I wanted. You know, this is this would be the ideal scanner. And so what I'll try to do is some, show you some of the work that we're doing in order to address this list. Now, I can unfortunately cannot put a check on any of them because we haven't solved the problem of anesthesia. But we're trying to, uh, you know, one at a time to try to deal with it. So one is the child-friendly small scanner, high-performance quiet gradients, wireless light flexible tailor coil, and wireless peripherals or motion tracking. These are the first things I want to talk about. They're all related to hardware. So no compressed sensing right now, just hardware stuff, you know, good, good old RF, you know, things like that, all right? Um, so let's talk about the rise of the machine. And when talking about the rise of the machine, it's really pediatric machine. This is what we want. So I don't know if you've seen this movie, Terminator Genesis. Uh, it's a great movie, but it also has an MRI scene. And what's amazing about MRI of the future you can turn the, turn the field on, you know, very, very high to get to a super high field. You know what's disappointing? It's not small. It's not portable, you know, but that's, that's what it is. But you can have a very, very high field that you can even crush a robot into it, okay? All right, let's talk about pediatric MRI machines. So I think it's time for a dedicated pediatric scanner. And... Um, one of the things that we have is we applied for a grant from the NIH and that was actually funded by an NIBIB. And the idea there is to take the head scanner uh, that uh, is GE is making, this is an example from uh, uh, Matt Bernstein, a Mayo Clinic uh, head-only scanner, and convert it into a pediatric scanner. It has a 37 centimeter bore, perfect to up to a 10 year old, year -old body. Okay, um, 26 centimeter field of view, but the gradients are sweet, sweet gradients that you can go and, you know, scan faster. And they're not very loud because it's a small gradient. And the, uh, the amount of stimulation that will get probably be less, again, because of the small bodies as well with the small side. This is a work with my colleagues at Stanford, John Pauly, Greg Scott, um, Dan, uh, there's Brian Hargreaves, Shres Vasnawala, who's the best pediatric uh, radiologist I've ever worked with, and my colleague Anna Arias at Stanford, which are uh, partners in crime to many, many things. Um, this, is, this is our kind of vision. Our vision is to have, you know, a child-friendly scanner, uh, not intimidating. Um, you know, high bandwidth receivers that we can actually use the, the, the fast gradients. Child-friendly focused audiovisual, right? We want to maybe project inside the scanner so they don't have to actually wear anything on them. That's really important. Pediatric sequences, we have to adjust all the sequences to exploit those, but again, make sure that we don't violate, uh, you know, PNS, for example. Preparation, so make everything accessible such that, uh, you know, uh, the patient is prepared. The child-friendly suite, but we also want coils that are super close to the, uh, to the body. And we don't want really to put anything on the body, as much as little as possible. So we want all the uh, peripherals to be either wireless or just integrated into uh, you know, the clothing of, of, of the patient. That's, that's really the dream that we, that we want. Now this picture is from, uh, this, uh, this I took actually from uh, uh, Michael Hansen and Peter Kelman from the NIH. This is a pediatric dedicated coil that they had asked for, you know, for, uh, you know uh, they had a, um, uh, a call to, 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 to develop one. But, but look, you know, look at what's on the child. I mean, they have to connect, be connected to, you know, infusion, there, there's peripherals, all this stuff, and then you stick this coil on, on them. This is not what really you want to do. And you want to avoid that and make it much more pleasant. And this was our dream about 10 years ago, and when we thought about how a coil should be. A coil should be, you know, like clothing, something that really fits, comfortable, not heavy, not intimidating, and everything uh, very sweet. And, the, um, and what we've uh, developed, tried to develop, is to use printed uh, electronics technology uh, with my colleagues at, at Berkeley, in particular, Anna Claudia, that she's an expert in, uh, in um, and printed electronics to make something that is really light and flexible. Uh, the idea there is to use screen printing onto flexible substrates. We can go and print metals onto really, really new substrate that has not been used before, where you can directly print those elements and make coils that are very, very light and flexible. Um, you know, this has been a long time in the making. 
uh, we were able to make arrays out of these coils. This is just an example of a single element that is, is made into, uh, uh, in the, with this process. But really, this is one of the first arrays that we made. It was a 12 channel, all printed antennas. We use remote detuning, nothing on the coil, really to make it as soft and, 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 and um, flexible as possible. Very unique packaging that is child friendly and it weighed only 360 grams. Uh, we scanned patients at Stanford with this. This is just uh, examples of imagery that you can see. This is a patient and you see, well, that's, you know, that's much nicer. You actually can put the bellows on top of the coil because it's so soft. And here is actually where you can put it in. You know, this is where the coil is. This is, uh, uh, you know, just below the bellows, right? So it's, it's very light and flexible. There was a study of 20 patient usability. Uh, and of course, the coil was preferred and the SNR was similar to a 32 channel coil. Uh, that was published uh, recently in radiology, maybe a couple of years ago. Um, but you know what? You really want to take that even further. And this is uh, actually the product that InkSpace Imaging is going to produce and going to, uh, into the market, hopefully very, very soon. This is going to be up to a 510K submission. And I have to say, going through this entire process, I'm, you know, I'm pretty much humbled by what is necessary to take a technology that was developed in a university and really translate into uh, clinical practice. I mean, I, I have, you know, all the engineers that are working this in InkSpace, I'm just, I have, you know, my uh, sincere gratitude. This is very hard work to validate the safety, in particular with this type of a blanket coil, because that blanket coil can be put anywhere. It's not like a head coil where it's very static. Sorry, Victor, I think we have just a problem now. Oh, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> I can stop share and I can share again. Yeah, maybe also. Sorry about that. No, uh, not your fault. <laughs> I'll take full responsibility. <laughs> That's kind, yeah. How's that? No, yeah, and then, yeah, no. and then I'm gonna mute. There you go. And you see how nicely it lays on this in the, on the page. It's like it's, it's really, really light and, and nice. So I'm hoping that this would really change uh, pediatrics. Now, I got fascinated into this, you know, fabrication. And the idea there is, you know, why can we just automate the whole process of making devices? I mean, is it possible? So we have a very gifted student, Anna and I, uh, Karthik uh, Gopalan, who's taking this into a next level to try to think about how you go from a digital design with additive manufacturing to make such, uh, such hardware for MRI that's high quality. So he's been developing this method using vacuum thermoforming as well as computational forming to, understand, to put basically those elements onto, uh, onto 3D. And this is just an example of a, of a head code that you can actually do. So here's the process that, uh, that, uh, that he developed. And the idea here that you have some computational uh, vacuum forming that you can simulate how the elements would be, you know, uh, distorted. So basically how the, how the uh, plane that you go onto the subject would be distorted. And once you do that, you can do pre-distortion. When you go and make that in, in two dimensions, then you're going to form it, right? So there's a lot of computation that's, that is used there. So instead of this pattern, you would go and print those, uh, those patterns onto a 2D substrates. Then you have to do some surface treatment in order to be able to make, to metallize this, uh, this pattern. So we use, uh, for example, sandblasting in this particular case. You do some cat catalyzation with palladium. Uh, the palladium goes onto the uh, prepared surface and then it's use, uh, we use this when we go and uh, perform after. So then we do uh, forming onto the 3D structure, then the palladium is still there. So now we're gonna go and do electroless copper plating using a very particular uh, bath that uh, you know, uh, has a nice, nice chemistry about it. But the idea there is that once you put it in, now it's metallized and it has very high conductivity copper, which you can then go and plate and then populate with, uh, you know, with uh, tuning and matching and get really, really nice array. This is a nice array that was designed in particular for the back of my head. Um, with, you can see a pretty high SNR, we're supposed to be on the visual cortex. And when you go and, uh, and scan with this, this is just an example on, uh, uh, of a 0.5 by 0.5, almost uh, isotropic uh, on, our, on our scanner at UC Berkeley. And you can get really, really nice resolution that I see better resolution on my screen, to be honest, than what's presented here. Uh, but it's a really, really nice SNR cord. Now you can even take this further and think about, oh wow, once we can go and metallize 
on plastic, what, what else we can do? Well, we can 3D print stuff and we can leave tubes inside the, the, uh, the 3D printed structure and then move the solution to uh, electroless copper plate the inside of those tubes and effectively make wires. And this, uh, this, uh, this is a work by Julian Mar uh, Maravilla, who's, uh, who's another student that we just uh, joined. And the idea is you can use it to do RF circuits now in 3D. Also, gradients and shim, that's possible. And so you can flow these solutions within these 3D printed things. And here's just an example of a, an RF coil that you can see it's quite conductive once you do this uh, process. Okay, well, you know, working on coils, you know what's the number one problem? It's not the coils, it's not the elements, it's the freaking cables. It's the cables. Cables that connect those elements and the main cable, they're heavy. You know, for safety, you have to use these traps on them. If you don't use those traps, you can basically get RF burns on your patient, you know, or those hit actually quite a bit. And these traps are resonant and they cannot be flexible. So, you know, your cable system looks like this. You can make a nice, really light coil, but then the cable system is just heavy and not nice. So Ekin Karasan is one of uh, uh, my students started developing a new ways of making trap, and the idea is to use a flexible trap, a resonant trap, using toroids. And these are small toroids that you can actually tune them. This is a very nice architecture using a twisted pair that you can actually resonate. And the idea is, is to make an array of them. Instead of a single one, you can make this flexible array. And once these are small, each one of them has very low blocking, but when you put them all together, you actually get the nice blocking that you want. And now it's also flexible and also lighter. And the, uh, this is a cable system that we made and we call them caterpillar uh, traps, obviously, because uh, they look like caterpillar. But the idea is that the blocking is everywhere. Now you don't have to think where to put the traps, you just put them the entire cable. And the nice thing about it, it's actually safer and more robust than the, tr than the cable trap that, uh, that are on this commercial coil. This is an example of a B1 field measurement underneath a wire that was coiled. You're not supposed to do that, they tell you. Why? Because of course, because then you'll have a B1 variation. But with these traps, because there's blocking the entire cable, then the B1 field doesn't change. So this is, this is really nice. Now, if you really want to get rid of cables, well, you have to go wireless. And this is the work from, um, from John Polly and Greg Scott, our colleagues at Stanford, that are trying to make uh, um, uh, wireless coils. And they basically nailed almost every piece of this. For example, wireless power transfer, you know, how to synchronize the scanner when uh, things are wireless, you know, how to uh, spoil, uh, you know, activate the queue spoiling wirelessly, and how to transmit the data wirelessly. And then with the addition of technology developed at uh, ETH, I think it's possible now to put all of these together and make wireless code. You know, system integration is unfortunately not as easy, but this is really uh, where it's going to go. Okay, so let's move on from, uh, from, uh, from RF coils into another wireless stuff. We've seen what would you put on the baby, but you want to really monitor the, you know, uh, all, the, all the heart rate and the breathing and, and the motion. Why, why have something on the, you know, uh, on, the, on the subject? Can you do something wireless? Well, uh, this is a work by Suma Anand, again, another uh, uh, great uh, graduate student. And, you know, it's, we, we, we looked at, uh, she, she looked at this work by, by Siemens where they use a piloton. And the idea with a piloton is you transmit, actually, you have a, a transmitter within the bore. You transmit slightly off resonance such that it doesn't interfere with the bandwidth of the MMR, but appears at the side of the image. And it's just the tone that is received by the cords. And the idea there is that the coils are modulated by, uh, the, the, that signal that is received is modulated by motion uh, because of the different loading that happens when you have uh, motion. So you don't need any extra hardware. Uh, but unfortunately, the limitation here, you're bound to the Lamour frequency. You have to transmit the Delamour, close to the Lamour frequency. And that's either, you know, 127 meg or 123 for Siemens. Or, you know, if you have a 1.5, it will be 60, 63. So, you know, it's only there. Now, for this piloton, the dominant source of modulation is the coil loading. So you can really get about just 5% of the signal changes because of the changes in the Q, and that's what you see. But you know what? Other frequencies interact with the body very, very differently. 
So for example, if you use 2.5, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, I don't know, something else. Well, that will interact with the body very, very differently, would not maybe be affected by the core loading, maybe something else, reflections within the bore. And in fact, if you actually look at the HFSS simulation, this is the field uh, of uh, 127 megahertz, and this is the field inside the, uh, inside the bore of 2.4 uh, gigahertz. Very, very different very different behavior. So maybe we can make a more sensitive if we use those fre high frequencies instead of low frequencies and kind of make a radar. The question is like, how do you still receive it with the cords? Do you want to add more hardware? I mean, like, what do you, how do you do then? Well, the idea here is, you know, let the preamp do the work for you because preamps in MRI supposed to be linear, but nothing is linear in the real world. They're, going to have a nonlinear component. So we're going to transmit two tones separated with each other at the Lamour frequency, but the carrier will be at 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8. Right? So we, we transmit this beat uh, tone, so we call it beat pilot tone. Both we beat the pilot tone from beating point of view, but also we beat it from pulsing, pulsing it. And that's the idea. And so Basically, a coil will receive those uh, transmission inefficiently because it's tuned to 128, but still it goes through. It will go through and get to the preamp somehow. And if you transmit strong enough, it will get to the preamp anyway. Uh, and then what would happen, it will mix it. It will mix in the preamp. But you know, the mixing, you know, all you have to do is, you know, you don't really have to transmit much power. All you need to do is that the amount of power coming in is the same level as the MR signal. With the MR signal is like, what, minus 50 dBm? It's like, it's really low. So it's really, you don't need more than one dBm at 2.4 in order to achieve that. So you really are not driving, uh, you know, the, uh, the amplifier to, to the levels that you worry that they're going to affect the MR signal. So how we do it, we will transmit those two frequencies, combine those uh, power, have a power amplifier that you can buy all, you know, this is 2.4 gigahertz, it's all Wi-Fi, right? So you just use this Wi-Fi hardware, high pass filters, you make sure that there's no intermodulation being sent. And then there you go, antenna inside the bore, you put it up, we use software defined radius for this, really cheap, really easy to make, everybody could do it tomorrow, I'm sure Andrew will do it. Um, uh, because it's so easy, it's so easy to do. So here's just examples. So we put this antenna here, a Wi-Fi antenna inside the bore, and we have this motion phantom that's moving. And here you see the magnitude of the beat pilot tone. You know, it's 25%. 25% of the signal modulation is happening. This is a pilot tone. Now, the reason that the pilot tone is not doing anything is because there's no coil loading there. This is not a loading phantom. But still, we see a lot of changes in the beat pilot tone. We also see phase. Now, we were surprised about this phase. Where does this phase come from? It's not supposed to appear there because, you know, you have basically the two tones, uh, you know, the phase needs to be exactly like in the same as the pilot tone. What well, turns out there's a lot of probably AM to PM uh, intermodulation, it's called, and that, that's an issue, but still you have very sensitive uh, signals there. Um, when you zoom in onto the pilot tone, you start seeing something, but look, it's very, very little amount of modulation. Now, the cool thing is that now we can make it sensitive to other things. Like, pilot tone is really not that sensitive to kind of head motion. That's not like, you know, a big effect. Well, here's an example of an SSFP scan, and you see the beat pilot tone with the head motion left and right. You can see that. Well, we can put, you know, these antennas in multiple direction. We can transfer the multiple frequency. Perhaps we can actually model this entire thing without uh, needing to do anything else. And this is an example of what you see with the pilot tone, of course, is not very sensitive. So there's huge advantages of going to, to high frequencies. Very excited about this one. Okay, so now um, let's move on to uh, the other parts of the list. Well, heavy compute, rapid comprehensive sequences. We want sequences that do a lot of things together, not you know, in order to short the scan time. But we also want to exploit the type of reconstruction, the type of signals uh, uh, into that. So let's talk quickly about that. So this is the rise of the machine again, but now machine computation and perhaps also machine learning. So MRI is really, you know, MRI is really like old cameras. Okay, really early cameras. You know, you see this picture, 1838. What's weird about this picture? What's weird about it that, you know, it's supposed to have all this stuff going on in the street. There's nothing in the street. And the reason there's nothing in the street because it was a half an hour exposure. 
half an hour exposure, all the street got blurred out. But the one subject that was getting their shoes waxed, well, then you could see some silhouette because they were standing still. This is MRI. Okay, lots of things going on. But we can't see them, right? We can't see them. But there are some techniques that you can exploit. You know, there's really signals that have low dimensionality. Wavelets, gone. Low rank, still out there, but also newer learned models can be exploited in order to exploit this redundancy, in order to perhaps model from these measurements and be able to get something out of it and, uh, and get more resolution, both in time and space. Now, this is an extreme work by Frank Ong, a former graduate student, then postdoc at Stanford, now went to industry. Very sad, but since I think you're hiring, this would be an amazing catch, by the way, <laughs> because an amazing, amazing engineer, very creative, and did this most amazing work, and so I had to put this advertisement here. Now he's working for some social, uh, uh, social um, uh, network, uh, new company startup, making a lot of money, but I think he could do well back in academia. Anyway, this is, this, is, uh, this is a case where you have a DCE, you inject contrast and you want to see this, right? So there's many ways to try to deal with this, but you know what? There's really complex dynamics that's going on. How do you deal with that? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a non-Cartesian acquisition, just keeps on sampling, keep on sampling, and then not gate or not go to multiple dimension, just reconstruct this by exploiting some redundancy in the data. Now we're talking about 16 channel, 256 squared, times 512 time points. This is a terabyte of images to be reconstructed. So you have to not only model compactly, you know, have a, a low dimensional representation of the data, but also you have to store it somehow. Otherwise you can't compute. So Frank really, really did it. He developed this multi-scale low rank representation that can take this dynamic and compactly represent it using low rank component. This is a really nice work that was published in, uh, in IEEE uh, uh, Topics and Signal Processing. And then he took it even further and basically implemented this efficient distributed stochastic optimization that enforces this low dimensional using this uh, data driven model that can be separated on GPUs that you can then iteratively go and reconstruct this really redundant data set, basically reconstructing hundreds of gigabyte images from just two gigabyte of raw data. So really is compressed sensing, right? And the matrix sizes are, are insane. That was, that was recently published called Extreme MRI. And I mean, this, this three dimensional, you know, breathing baby that has you know, the, the contrast dynamic all at the same time. We're still not catching the cardiac, by the way, at this point, but I think it's still possible. Uh, and then it's just unbelievable. I've never seen such, such a beautiful uh, DCE exam as, as this one. You can see also the accumulation of fluid in the lungs uh, now in this particular frame. Now, what you also uh, don't realize often is that once you have motion, coil sensitivity changes. We ignore it. We ignore this because it's too hard. Shreya doesn't ignore it. That's another grad student that's been using similar ideas that Frank is introducing to the reconstruction, but also applying this on maps. Now, the thing is, if you have now this, I don't know, 512 data sets, and you have to store maps for each one of those time points, that's impossible. She came up with a really nice representation to store these maps that you know are about one megabyte of memory, or maybe 10 megabyte instead of you know, uh, 10, 10 gigabyte, right? So uh, that is extremely useful. Okay. Moving on, let's now talk about intelligence and not AI really. I mean, it's really compressive sensing in the modern age where you actually learn the signals, right? So that, that is the idea. Um, and then we have, a, we have a twist onto that. And the twist is we want to really uh, be able to um, imit Im imitate how people look at images and decide, well, you know, what's a good image or not. So the eye is amazing, it's amazing, right? Like when you look at an image, you say, nah, this is blurred. You look at another image, ah, this has an artifact. Very clear to us. Algorithms don't know how to do that that well. I mean, they know approximately mean square, SSIM and that kind of stuff, but really it doesn't, doesn't work that well. 
What we really like doing, and we've seen that the huge revolution is these supervised uh, deep learning technique that basically enforce data consistency as well as use a network in order to perform what's called denoising. It's not really denoising, but a proximal operator, but there's this iteration that you make sure that you have data consistency over and over again throughout those iterations. That makes the reconstruction stable. One of the methods is MODL that we really like um, uh, to use. Uh, developed elsewhere from uh, uh, um, Matthew Jacobs' group. Uh, but here's, here's the idea. You still need to train the supervised method by some loss metric. And what is this loss metric that you're going to put? Mean square error between the image that you have? Uh, L1, SSIM, what, what are you going to use? The network will just try to minimize what you give it. Okay. So that's the issue. So there's limitation with all these ones, right? Like L1 is pixel-wise really no perceptual information. I mean, there's really, uh, this is a really bad, bad measure. SSM is a little bit better, but you know, it's handcrafted features. Um, not specific really to MRI, it's really specific to mo most images. You can use GANs, but GANs are kind of like an instance to set type of loss. They're very in unstable in some ways. Like you really have to work hard not to hallucinate uh, new stuff. And finally, people have developed this perceptual loss, you know, VGG loss, uh, very, very nice work that does capture perceptual feature by training onto segmentation networks. But you have to have then supervised data, but really how many supervised data do we have for MR? So that's, that's a problem. So we want to come up with maybe a method to create this type of perceptual loss that you can train, but uns in an unsupervised ways. And this is a work that, done with Stella Yu, uh, is a colleague. Uh, she's an adjunct at UC Berkeley, but also at the ICSI, uh, International, Com uh, International Computer uh, uh, Science Institute, as well as, but this is uh, the work of uh, Kei Wang, who's the, who's, the, uh, mainly, who's the main person there, and of course other people involved, in also uh, with GE. Um, now, the idea there is to learn representation of these perceptual features without supervision. How do you do that? Well, it's, it's not easy. By the way, this paper is out on archive. I highly recommend checking it out. Well, first of all, let's say you come up with this type of loss. Well, how, where do you put it? We're going to put it there, right? Just along the MSC loss, we can add that type of loss, all right? So, you know, that's another thing. So you can put it in any type of architecture that you develop for reconstruction. Okay, so let's, let's stick it over there. Now, how do you compute, compute this loss? Well, this particular loss that we came up with is a patch-based one. Why a patch base? And how big is the patch? Well, too small of a patch, you don't see anything. Too bigger of a patch or like a whole image, you know, it's too much. Network needs to learn what an image is, right? So somewhere in between. And that also makes it more stable. We're also supervising, the, the loss is instant to instance. You have a patch over here, it's being pushed through the system. You know, you get some features, you also take it the, like, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the ground truth, you take the same patch, you push it through, and you compare the L2 distance in the feature space. Now, what's this feature space? That's a good question. How do you actually come with this? This is a little bit of a busy slide, but let me just guide you through. It's actually quite simple. The whole idea with this unsupervised method is to take patches for many, many images. You take this patch, you put it push it through some network. It doesn't really matter what that backbone is that takes the patches and moves it into a smaller dimensional space. It tries to squeeze it into a small dimensional space. So all these patches will end up being small in terms of uh, size. And you also want all these patches to be as far as possible from each other. Now, because the space is small, what ends up that patches that are close in some sense will end up closer. Patches that are far away from some sense we end up further away. Now, what it will be? Well, I don't know. We're hoping that it will have some features that are be useful. So are these useful? Well, they actually end up being quite useful. You see that, you know, with a certain clustering, you get very, very similar visually looking patches. They're not exactly the same. If you compare the mean square error, it's terrible. But in the feature space, they look really nice. Both here at the bottom, but these are far away from each other. So that edge is very far away from other edges. Okay, so that's kind of what you get. You can also do retrieval. How about you go to a, the database, you put this patch, you get these. Yeah, kind of similar, right? That's, you know, if I would go through a data set and I was like, oh, 
Is it close to this? Yeah, it's close. Visually, it's close. Mean square are not close. What about this one? What about this one? Yeah, they all seem close visually. So hopefully, you get some visual perception there to help you. So let's look how it, it does by adding this to this MODL reconstruction. So this is just an example from a 3D, uh, 3D reconstruction where we take just one slice and under sample uh, about eightfold using Poisson disk sampling. Um, you know, on the left, parallel imaging compressed sensing. Now it's very hard to see on this monitor and I apologize for this. Hopefully folks in Zoom are enjoying themselves now with really high quality. Uh, but MODL, you know, deep learning does way better than wavelets. I have to say, again, humbled. I mean, the result, so nice. I mean, something that I could not imagine that we'll be able to get to this level. So MODL with just pure MSC loss does really well. Okay, so it does well, but not as well as the original. If you actually compare it to the original, well, it's not, not, as, not as nice. But when you add this UF loss, so now MODL is on the left, and this is MODL with UF loss, well, you start, just images look more natural. Let's zoom in. This is the zoomed in version. You know, again, hard to see on this particular screen, but I have, I have to say, there's just more structure. There's more texture, you know, because it's able to reproduce something that you cannot reproduce with mean square error. Here's another example. Let's zoom into this area. In particular, also, you can look at the bone. The bone using UF loss, and again, it's, it's hard to, to see again on, on, on the screen. I apologize. If you look at my screen, you, you see that too, because I look and I, I was like, oh, that's nice. But then, you know. So the results are, look more authentic. They look like what they're supposed to do. If you look at these two, just, this is higher quality from a visual perspective, but not from MEC loss. That's another example. This one is from the fast MRI data set. And again, uh, MODL left. Uh, and, and in the middle, MODL with uh, pure F, uh, UF loss, and maybe we'd be able to see something that uh, nicer if I zoom in here. You see the edges are nicer, the definition of the structure are nicer. It, the structure is nicer. So that just adds to this type of reconstruction. So hopefully that would imitate. And the nice thing is you, you just take MR images and you run it through this thing and it learns it by itself. Then you use it as a, as a function. You can use it for dynamic data and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I just want to, uh, 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 want to emphasize things. When you use data in deep learning or machine learning, not all data is good for everything. And we just want to point out something. We have a paper that just came out that says, we call it sub subtle inverse crime. Why it's subtle inverse crime? Because some people take data that's not supposed to do for reconstruction and they try to emulate the reconstruction. But that data may have some pre-processing, for example, zero padding of case space, you know, just interpolation and all that stuff. And that can affect, you know, the quality of your reconstruction. You may think you're accelerating by a factor of 10, but you're maybe accelerating by a factor of two. So just to point it out, we wrote this paper. Hopefully some of you can read it and uh, be able to assess some of these issues. Uh, and this is, a, this is a work by Efrat Shimron, who's a postdoc in my group. Okay, so I'm about to be done, and I don't know, I lost completely time. Oh, uh, plenty of time. I'm going to just slow down now. <laughs> and, and talk about um, kind of how I see a scanner should be. Okay, we talked about all this list, but really, you know, the, I left the intelligent prescription with feedback. They're actually, you know, Siemens, GE, Philips, other companies, uh, another folks that are also friends of mine, I'll mention them, Heart Vista is another company that works on basically automatic prescription uh, of, of sequences that, that they're, you know, the, the scanner kind of runs by itself. So that is also a nice thing to have. But really, you need to think of the entire MRI exam as a combination of three agents. Okay. Two of them are humans, actually maybe even four. Two of them are humans. There's two humans there. One is the operator. There's one is the patient. And then you have the scanner itself, the physics, you know, the hardware that's going on and stuff, the peripherals, that's part of the system. There's maybe feedback that could go into, this, uh, into the patient. There's feedback that the operator sees. You know, all of these affect the scan, right? They all affect the scan. And of course, the 
computer that controls the sequences, plays the sequences, receives the data, and reconstructs. They're all a single system. And what we often try to do is just to optimize one of them. But really, it should be a holistic view of this entire system. Humans, part of it. So I have colleagues that work on human-robot interaction, where you put the human inside the system as part of the modeling. Really, that's what we should be doing. And we should be doing this not only from the uh, operator side, you know, to help the operator to run such a thing, uh, but also from the patient side. The patient side, you know, we read a lot of stuff from the patient, right? Like we read peripheral sensors and stuff. We read the raw data, right? We can do the reconstruction. But maybe we can also apply feedback to the subject. It could be visual. People have done that. It could be auditory, commands, or just maybe certain music or certain rhythm that will help the subject, but also maybe haptic feedback as well that would guide the subject to perform the best for the acquisition. And of course, then you have to change the acquisition to conform with that too, and what would be the right prescription. And of course, how do you inform then the operator and so on and so forth. Think about this thing holistically. Now, the reason I'm telling you this and not just doing this because I really don't know how to address all of it together, so I'm just like just throwing this idea. But really, this is, if you think about what you want to do in 10 years, I mean, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to look at this entire system and be able to guide it such that we minimize the scan time and maximize the success of the exam. Right? Those are the things that we want to do. And how do we look at the system? Okay, so we'll have a reconstruction, we'll have data acquisition, parameter mapping, uh, you know, uh, low rank, machine learning, all of that's fine. Affect the subject. The subject could maybe behave better. Operator, get some input. Maybe change the prescription. Maybe this needs to be automatic, but also maybe some intervention, maybe not. So this is really where I think the field should go to and look at it as an entire thing where human is part of the loop. With that, I just want to say thank you really for bringing, uh, bringing me here. I would like to thank my colleagues, the amazing colleagues that I, I, you know, one of the reasons I stayed in the Bay Area and didn't end up in Israel like I planned to is because of these amazing colleagues. And of course, my amazing group that uh, is, uh, is growing and I think it should stop at some point. But now we have also children. <laughs> and I, yeah, so thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, so, so there's time for questions. So thank you. Uh, very broad, you went just through <laughs> the, the whole pipeline. Wonderful. <laughs> so that was indeed uh, an awesome list of checkboxes that you uh, presented unchecked. So of all these checkboxes, which one do you think is the closest? What's the low-hanging fruit among them to really make a step forward to this pediatric uh, scanning? Yeah, so the, the pediatric scanner is going to happen. We told the NIH. So, uh, you know, they check us. Otherwise, no funding. But the, the scanner is coming to Stanford soon, and we'll be able to then uh, start populating and, you know, doing all that. So that will happen. The, that pediatric scanner, I believe it will happen. Um, coils wireless, I believe that will happen within the next five years for sure. Uh, somebody will do it. One of the vendors will have to do it. And, you know, maybe they're not completely wireless, but they'll be this light and comfortable and, you know, soft. The technology is there to happen. Um, wireless peripherals and comfortable peripherals, I think that would also happen very uh, quickly. What about removing anesthesia? Still very difficult. You know, uh, the reconstructions are hard, but the thing is what, what really makes, uh, makes it challenging is that you have to change the, um, the way um, the clinician think about doing this, right? Like, you know, um, if you have a case where, you know, you have some suspicion that the exam is not going to be successful, well, you may not want to take that risk. So a, a clinician thinks from you know, a, a, a diagnosis point of view, even though there are maybe issues that to the patient, you know, but they, they evaluate that risk, right? 
and they may just decide to go with anesthesia. So that is, it has to be much more robust. And robustness, you know, has to go somewhere and be implemented also by, you know, by the vendors. And I have to say, looking at compressed sensing, how fast it took from ideas to products. Like all the, all the, all the companies now have products, but it took 10 years. Deep learning, actually, some products, three years actually happened much quicker. So maybe, maybe there is a chance. Um, so, yeah, you can start putting a V, but it's not the complete V, you know, check. But it just start, I think, on some of them. Thanks. So with, with this idea of integrating so many different things together and maybe having feedback with uh, the sequence as it's running, etc., is this something to do with the vendors or is this something to do, I think, as, as Ben hinted, via something outside, via pulse sequence, via something else? Is it, is it just too difficult to integrate with a system that is not built to do that and will probably change, you know, version 11.6.3.8 um, later on? So should we be putting more time into things like the, the pulse seek and other things like that? What's your thought? Yeah, so, you know, being able to control every scanner ubiquitously, you know, without, you know, just having an API. And I think, actually, vendors are trying to, are getting into this where they would open their systems to API as opposed to, you know, a pulse sequence, you know, you have some API that would control and, you know, hopefully the, the, the API wouldn't change so you can actually do a lot of things. And I think that's possible with a lot of, you know, with some system that exists today. Uh, you know, um, I, I, think, I think the, the climate is such that uh, it's getting more and more ready and uh, vendors are opening some of their stuff, both in the post-processing and in the sequence design and, the, um, and also from the hardware point of view, I've seen some vendors are willing to also open an API, for example. So it is happening. Um, now, does it, does it need to be in academia? I think proof of concepts will happen in academia. Um, but you know, the, you can take a product up to a certain level, but really beyond that point, it's not research anymore. It really is a lot of engineering in order to put it together and it needs to be a market for it too. The vendors need to make money out of it, otherwise it really don't, doesn't make sense. But if you know, if you save, you know, like you can put more throughput, you know, that, that would definitely sell more magnets. So obviously, deep learning sells magnets today for, for vendors. So they're, they're seeing that. So hopefully that will happen. Okay, Nicole. Right, just very quickly. So um, I have a question that's kind of a follow-up to what Rude was asking before. So I really like your idea. Actually, I love your idea of just, like, let's redesign the whole concept of MRI for kids because they are different and it's not, like, what we have now is not really built for them. But it, as opposed to the low-lying fruits, like, where do you think of all of those features that you want to do? Wh what do you think would add the most value? Like, if we can you know, buy a head scanner that we can put a 10-year-old in. It seems like that's already huge. You know, like, yes, yeah. we would prefer to get rid of all the coils and the wires and stuff, but, you know, it feels like some of those elements or, you know, the super fast scanning where, you know, we don't have to worry about asking them to hold their breath or whatever. Like, where do you think, you know, maybe not the, the easiest things to implement, but the most important actually are? Yeah, you know, uh, we, we push compressed sensing and all these acceleration to a certain limit. You know, really gradients. They have to, and that's why I was, you know, dying for the scanner, because, you know, with a 750 or you know or a Prisma, I mean, there is a limit. I mean, you can't push it beyond that. But it's designed for a huge body, so really, the gradient system will bring so much, so much. You know, single shots, you know, that will save that. Just single shots will prevent a lot of anesthesia, if you can do them really, really well. So EPIs, spirals fast spin echo, all that stuff, you know, would work amazingly well on these type of systems. And I think that is going to make a huge difference. And it will put a dent into the need of doing a lot of the other things, but eventually those will happen too, because, you know, DCE doesn't go away, unfortunately. Um, you still need contrast and you still need, and that's 3D and that's problematic. Um, body, I mean, I work, I work a lot on body. So uh, heads, you know, maybe l l less hard in some ways, harder in some other ways. But body, you know, uh, abdomen, you know, uh, 
peristalsis motion, all that stuff. I mean, even to prevent that, you have to inject glu uh, glucose. I mean, it's terrible. You know, kids, you know, throw up and, you know, so you want to prevent that. So that's, that's going to, I think, address a lot of these. So this, the gradients, I, I believe, unfortunately, it's hardware. Again, that's going to make a lot of difference.